So um, just wanted to welcome everyone to Grand Rounds today. We have uh, Dr. Amrith Umberdecker, my colleague in advanced heart failure transplant and MCS. Um, he's associate professor of medicine. He is also the director of our heart transplant group. And um, he leads all our efforts for cardiac amyloid research and clinical practices. And um, he is supported a lot by one of our junior colleagues, David Raymer, who joined about a year ago, as well as uh, by Mona Cantu uh, and Maria Marsala, who see a lot of these patients because they need a lot of close follow-up. Um, Amrith uh, is very closely tied with a lot of the research groups uh, nationally with cardiac amyloid, and uh, he is our go-to amyloid expert. So with that, I'd like Amrith to go ahead and start. All right. I'm hoping you can see the screen. Is this working, I'm hoping? Yes. Perfect. Okay. And then I have to figure out how to minimize this thing here. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, so, you know, I, I thought I'd start with this kind of quote, you know, when you hear hoofbeats, look for horses, not zebras. And so, um, you know, in, in the medical education world, this was first uttered back in 1940s uh, at the University of Maryland. There was a professor named Theodore Woodward who kind of used this expression in that horses are a lot more common in Maryland as well as most other geographic areas. And um, the analogy to medicine was that unusual presentations of common things uh, are more likely to lead to a true diagnosis than a straightforward presentation of a medical fascinoma. There's a great uh, clip from the, the television show Scrubs uh, kind of describing this, but uh, amyloid has uh, traditionally fell, fallen in the zebra bucket, an unusual, pre an unusual diagnosis, a fascinoma that we really shouldn't pay attention to. Uh, and the horse has sort of been common things like HESPEF, hypertensive heart disease, aging uh, related changes. But uh, what I'm hoping over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes or so is to kind of dispel the myth that uh, amyloid is a zebra that we shouldn't pay attention to. And I think that's hard in Colorado because Colorado is known for the Broncos. And uh, there's some myths out there that I want to dispel. So the first myth is that there are no zebras in Colorado. And, and the analogy for amyloid is that I don't have any amyloid patients in my practice. And so uh, we'll, we'll hopefully dispel that myth. Um, the second myth that I'm hoping to dispel is that that you have to, you know, travel to an exotic, um, you know, con you know, exotic continent and go on an exotic safari in order to see a zebra. And, and the myth and, and the analogy in amyloid is that you have to refer a patient to a uh, tertiary referral center. You have to, you know, have your patients get an invasive biopsy, potentially see a bone marrow transplant specialist to make a diagnosis. And, and nowadays that's a myth. It's actually pretty easy to make a diagnosis of an amyloid with uh, pretty simple labs and imaging techniques. Um, and then the third myth that I want to dispel is that zebras are just, um, you know, dinner for lions. And the analogy for amyloid is that amyloid is a disease where there's no treatment. So who cares about it because you can't do anything about it. And that's actually a myth in 2020 because amyloid is very treatable now. Uh, so the first myth, cardiac amyloidosis is a rare disease. This is a myth that's actually propagated by industry. This is from the Pfizer website from uh, earlier this week, where Pfizer says, you know, amyloidosis is a rare disease. Uh, they are, you know, blatantly marketing it as a rare disease and actually got the drug uh, Tefamidus approved in the, under the rare disease uh, FDA approval pathway. And um, it's the actual single most expensive cardiovascular disease ever uh, um, developed uh, in terms of the price tag to our patients for, for Tefamidus. But it's a complete myth that it's a rare disease. Um, in fact, if you actually look at how patients uh, end up, um, you know, how many people they see, how many physicians they've seen, how often they've been misdiagnosed, it's actually very common. In a survey of patients that have known uh, ATTR or amyloid transthyretin cardiomyopathy, on average, they had visited five different providers before making a correct diagnosis. Greater than 50% of the hereditary patients and almost 40% of wild type patients uh, were misdiagnosed with an alternate condition. 75% of patients had been uh, receiving treatment for that misdiagnosed condition and hypertensive heart disease was the most common misdiagnosis. So these patients are out there, they're just sort of being missed. Um, and so I'll kind of ask you a question. Do you have a patient with HEFPEF in your practice? Most of us probably have at least a patient with HEFPEF. If you have a patient that's 
uh, above uh, 80, there's a reasonable chance that patient may have uh, may have wild type ATTR cardiomyopathy. This is a, a study of uh, autopsy um, looking for amyloid um, among HEFPET patients at the Mayo Clinic. And if you just look at among 80 year olds in this autopsy series, 40% uh, had evidence of some amyloid deposition on autopsy among 65 to 79 year olds, almost 10% had amyloid. So in reality, amyloid is not rare. It's just that most of our patients don't have a formal diagnosis. Um, so among HEFPEF patients, anywhere from 12 to 20% may have um, undiagnosed wild type ATTR cardiomyopathy. If you're an interventionalist doing TAVRs, uh, among low flow, low gradient degenerative uh, AS, up to 12% may have wild type ATTR. So it's, it's a lot, uh, it's out there if you're willing to kind of look under the surface. The second myth out there is that amyloid, um, to diagnose it, you have to go on an exotic safari that ends in an invasive biopsy. And, and while it's certainly uh, true that in some cases you do need to make uh, a biopsy-based diagnosis of amyloid, that's actually the minority of cases these days. Um, in today's practice, with the use of uh, technetium pyrophosphate scan and uh, kind of routine labs, it's possible to make a non-invasive diagnosis of amyloid in the majority of cases. And this is actually um, an algorithm. And we'll talk a little bit more in more detail how, how this works in terms of how do you make a diagnosis. But this is an algorithm we put together for uh, a recent American Heart Association scientific statement on how do you make a diagnosis of uh, amyloid. Um, and we'll kind of go over that um, and how it works at the um, institution that we have where we do have PYP scans available. And the third myth that I'm hoping to dispel uh, over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes or so is that Broncos are winners and we have all these great treatments for HEFs and who cares about amyloid because there's no treatment for it. And in reality, it's actually the opposite. If you look at HEFPEF trials, it's been you know, negative trial after negative trial, similar to the Broncos who've had quite a few losses. On the other hand, amyloidosis in 2020 is completely treatable. Uh, in fact, since 2018, there's actually been um, three studies, all published in the New England Journal, Patizaran um, for the treatment of hereditary TTR amyloidosis, inotericin uh, in the same issue, uh, and then finally Tafamidus in the September issue of New England Journal. And um, Patizaran and inotericin were approved in 2018, Tafamidus was approved in 2019. So we've had three drugs approved for the treatment of uh, amyloidosis um, recently where we've had essentially zero treatments approved for HEFF. So uh, outline, we'll kind of go over a little bit the definition and types of amyloidosis, um, focus a lot on the diagnosis, because I think that's probably the most important takeaway is how do you diagnose amyloid, then go a little bit into how do you manage the cardiac complications and the treatment of the underlying pathology. So uh, amyloidosis uh, is uh, the aggregation of insoluble fibrous deposits of uh, misfolded beta pleated sheets into various, um, various tissues. And when it's deposited in the heart, the bottom picture of the gross um, anatomy picture here, you can see this pink amorphous material in the left ventricle and the right ventricle. These are amyloid protein deposits. If you look at it under microscopy, these uh, pink amorphous material is the pro protein beta pleated sheets that are deposited in the myocardium. This leads to myocyte distortion and separation, uh, tissue stiffening, organ dysfunction. There's some thoughts that some of these presoluble fibers may have direct myotoxic effects. Uh, and the clinical consequences we see from this myocardial thickening are we see uh, diastolic dysfunction, kind of a restrictive cardiomyopathy phenotype, and then oftentimes conduction abnormality. Uh, there's about 20 different kinds of amyloid types that um, can affect various uh, organs, but from a cardiac standpoint, there's really two that are that are worth focusing on. Um, one is systemic light chain amyloidosis, or the other name for this is AL amyloidosis. And historically, this has been the most common uh, reported in the literature. A lot of that has to do with the referral bias. You know, when centers like Mayo Clinic and uh, places in Boston report their their outcomes in their single centers, they have a large number of patients referred to their bone marrow transplant programs for light chain amyloidosis. So it's it's reported as the most common. In reality, wild type ATTR is much more common. Uh, it's just underdiagnosed. But systemic light chain amyloidosis, um, plasma cells uh, secrete uh, immunoglobulin light chains. And when they are deposited in the heart, that cardiac AL amyloidosis, this is the most rapidly progressive of the amyloidosis. 
average survival is on the order of six to 18 months without treatment. Uh, nowadays, it's very treatable. So uh, some of the survival statistics, uh, you really have to look at the time, time when um, the patients were diagnosed in terms of how they do. The next bucket from a cardiac standpoint is really transthyretin amyloidosis or ATTR cardiomyopathy. It kind of falls under into two categories. One is what's known as familial uh, amyloidosis or mutant or hereditary amyloidosis or variant amyloidosis. The, the, the concept with that is that it is a genetic mutation in the TTR gene that results in an abnormal uh, protein that the liver produces. And then it's subsequently deposited primarily in the heart causing cardiomyopathy and in the nerves causing polyneuropathy. Uh, this has an intermediate prognosis. It really depends on the uh, mutation type uh, in terms of how the prognosis is. Uh, intermediate prognosis around survival of three to five years from symptom onset without treatment. And then the most common kind of amyloid is uh, wild type transthyretin amyloid. The uh, former name for this was uh, senile amyloid, but I think um, you know, our, our senior citizen population didn't like to be called senile. So they, they prefer to be known as active living wild type uh, patients. So the, the name was changed to wild type ATTR cardiomyopathy. Uh, this is very underdiagnosed. It, it tends to have a slow indolent uh, progression, um, oftentimes you know, five years or so from symptom onset. Uh, it turns out patients are often diagnosed pretty late in the, in the stage, and so it's kind of difficult to answer questions about survival in patients that are, you know, potentially 80 years old to start with, potentially have had this for five years, and then they ask, how long am I going to live when I'm 80 years old and have had this for five years? But uh, it, it's definitely the most common if you look for it. So the principles of diagnosing amyloid are that you really have to have a high index of suspicion. You have to be able to recognize the zebra stripes, so to speak. And if you don't think of amyloid, you won't be able to diagnose it. So um, a key um, kind of red flag, if you will, for diagnosing amyloid is when you have HEFPEF with unexplained left ventricular hypertrophy. So when you have a wall thickness um, on your imaging tests um, that looks like the walls, the LV walls are greater than 1.4 centimeters, um, that's usually not from kind of, you know, borderline uncontrolled hypertension. If your patient is, has a blood pressure of 142 over 92 because they walked all the way back in from our waiting room and the MA took the blood pressure really quick, but they've otherwise had reasonable blood pressure control, that doesn't give you a wall thickness of, you know, one and a half centimeters or so. There's a differential for um, a wall thickness that high, and, and the differential is actually pretty small. It's usually something like Fabre's disease. If you're in you know, Matt Taylor's clinic, it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy potentially, or it's, it's, it's really amyloidosis. And so you have to be able to think of what is a differential for that degree of LVH and uh, amyloid should be on that differential. Uh, another common mistake is that um, the prevalence of hypertension is, is, is high among African-Americans, but the valine 122 mutation is also very prevalent in African-Americans. Uh, anywhere from four to five percent of the African American population will have are, are carriers of the mutation, and so there's a lot of overlap with when you see HEFPEF and LVH um, in African Americans. There's a good chance that they may have the valine 122 mutation and have hereditary amyloid cardiomyopathy that's undiagnosed. Um, another red flag is when you see hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a pericardial effusion, AV block, intraatrial septal hypertrophy, apical sparing on imaging. Uh, or even if you see hypertrophic cardiomyopathy diagnosed at an older age, it's kind of rare to see a 70 year old with brand new diagnosed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That's much more likely to be, uh, you know, wild type amyloid cardiomyopathy than, than a true hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, looking for the discordance between LV uh, voltage and the wall thickness, I think is a key uh, red flag to look out for. So uh, it's kind of a myth to think that you, you have to have a low voltage on the ECG. That actually happens in only the minority of cases. But when you see that the wall thickness on your imaging modalities show that, there, that there's LVH, but the ECG doesn't show LVH, that's a, that's a reason to think of amyloid. When you see LVH and there's symptoms of polyneuropathy or dysautonomia, things like carpal tunnel syndrome, lumbar spinal stenosis, spontaneous bicep tender rupture, that would be a, a tip off to think about amyloidosis. Uh, and then another kind of myth out there is that, well, the patient had a normal SPEP. They don't have amyloid because they had a normal SPEP. Um, so there's a couple of things wrong with that. 
Uh, the, the first is that the SPEP alone is not a particularly sensitive test. Um, if you're really worried about AL amyloidosis, you need to do an SPEP with immunofixation electrophoresis, uh, a UPEP with immunofixation electrophoresis, and the serum free light chain. Those three tests in combination have a sensitivity of 99% plus for diagnosing AL amyloidosis. But if you do the SPEP alone, the sensitivity is more like 50 or 60%. Um, when you're ordering these things at University Hospital in Epic, you actually have to click a button that says perform immunofixation um, you know, automatically or something like that. You can't click the reflex button um, because otherwise they won't do it. So that's kind of a thing to look out for. The other issue with the SPEP is that the SPEP and the immunofixation and light chains is really looking for AL amyloidosis. It tells you nothing about ATTR cardiomyopathy or transthyretin cardiomyopathy. And so for for patients that you're thinking about ATTR cardiomyopathy, you still have to proceed with um, diagnosing um, them through uh, other means. So in terms of kind of the overview of kind of the, the various diagnostic modalities we use for amyloidosis, in terms of labs, the SPEP, UPEP, and light chains are, are critical. Um, I, I usually don't say never, but um, I would say never order an SPEP and UPEP unless you're going to be ordering the serum-free light chains as part of that. The serum-free light chains are a very inexpensive test and are absolutely critical. That's probably the biggest mistake I see is that the, the light chains were not ordered as part of the uh, workup for amyloidosis. Uh, the cardiac biomarkers can have uh, important value as well. They're often done anyway, um, just as a sort of routine cardiac evaluation, the troponin values, low level elevations can be a, cr a clue for infiltrative diseases. Um, the BNP and, and NT pro BNP, whichever your facility is using are, are helpful in terms of gauging severity of heart failure and prognosis. Sometimes they're helpful in kind of the uh, AL patients and determining whether um, you know, they're a candidate for various um, therapies and things like that. Um, so I think they're overall, the, the biomarkers are kind of interesting prognostic ma ma um, markers, but not particularly specific for amyloid. Uh, ECG tends to be done routinely on uh, patients as part of the workup. And again, it's the discordance between LVH that you see on imaging versus the uh, voltage you see on the EKG. And so the principle there is if you have um, actual myocyte hypertrophy and actual left ventricular hypertrophy from things like aortic stenosis or hypertension, you have myocyte hypertrophy that leads to increased uh, LV voltage on the ECG. In an, infiltrate, an infiltrative process like uh, amyloid, you don't actually have uh, true myocyte hypertrophy. You just have the wall thickness increasing on your imaging modalities. And so you don't see that corresponding increase in voltage on the ECG. And so it's really the discordance is, is the tip off. Um, you can also see a bunch of nonspecific patterns on the ECG, pseudo-infarction patterns, conduction delays. Sometimes you can see atrial and ventricular arrhythmias with more extensive involvement. Uh, echo tends to be a primary screening modality that most of our patients end up getting. Uh, the ejection fraction tends to stay normal until very late stages of disease. Again, I think the left ventricular hypertrophy is the key takeaway. If the wall thickness is greater than 1.4 centimeters, what is the reason for that? And, um, it's not because the blood pressure is 140 over 90. If the blood pressure is you know, 200 over 100, maybe I can, I can buy that it's you know, just pure uh, LVH from hypertension. But I think you have to have a differential for your uh, left ventricular hypertrophy on an echo. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot in echo books about uh, a starry sky pattern or sparkling uh, echogenicity of the LV walls. And I think you know, we've, we've, when we look at echoes, I think a lot of us have seen this and sort of can, you know, will sometimes describe that sort of pattern. Uh, a lot of the newer ultrasound machines, you can kind of crank up the gain and make anything look um, amyloid-like. So I think it's probably not all that specific. Uh, there's a lot of other non-specific um, kind of markers on echo, biatrial enlargement, valvular thickening, Doppler parameters of diastolic dysfunction or, or high filling pressures can all be kind of tip-offs. Um, the apical sparing pattern on speckle tracking strain, I think, is, is something that there's a lot of publications about, and it's certainly helpful if you are routinely doing strain and you can see it. Um, I think one mistake that I sometimes see is that um, you don't have to do strain to diagnose amyloid, and, and sometimes it actually leads to delays. I mean, a patient shouldn't go from echo to referred for a strain echo and then referred for additional testing. If you, if you based off an of echo and clinical findings, think that the patient has amyloid, there's no reason to do strain to further delineate that. I think you can 
kind of move on to other diagnostic modalities to get a diagnosis quicker. Uh, MRI could be a helpful adjunct in terms of diagnosing uh, infiltrative cardiomyopathies, including amyloid. It's obviously the, the mainstay in um, assessing for chamber size and wall thickness and LV mass. Uh, MRI is particularly helpful if you're trying to entertain other infiltrative modalities, things like hemochromatosis or sarcoid, and, and MRI can help differentiate those from amyloid. Uh, if you're worried about pericardial pathology, an MRI can be quite helpful. Uh, and there are some characteristic um, contrast enhancement patterns that are pretty specific for amyloid. Amyloid tends to be a diffuse disease affecting not only the left ventricle, but the right ventricle and the atria as well. And so you can sort of see that on this picture here where there's uh, abnormal contrast enhancement in the right ventricle, left ventricle, as well as a little bit in the atria. Um, when you see atrial thickening, that's pretty specific for amyloid as well. There's not a lot of other cardiomyopathies that affect the atria um, and cause intraatrial um, you know, atrial thickening as well. So that's something to look out for on the MRI. Um, biopsy has a role in some select cases and we'll kind of go over uh, kind of the algorithm and when biopsy has a role. Uh, fat pad biopsy to some extent is the easiest modality to do. It's um, oftentimes can be done with um, kind of like a, a cytology base where uh, you, know, you basically use a, um, a, a larger bore needle and just uh, suck out uh, fat from um, kind of the abdomen and you can look at it under a microscope and that's kind of the simplest way of doing a fat pad biopsy. Uh, you can have a surgeon be involved and actually take a, a chunk of fat out and if you do that, your diagnostic yield increases. Um, I think a key point with fat pad biopsy is that a, a negative fat pad biopsy does not exclude amyloidosis. The sensitivity of fat pad biopsy for AL amyloidosis is somewhere in the 50 to 80% range. I think if you're at the Mayo Clinic and you're getting a big chunk, it's more like 80%. At our hospital, it's probably 50%. Um, if you're at a community hospital that does you know, one of these a year, it might be even lower than 50%. Um, so you can't stop with a negative fat pad biopsy. For transthyretin amyloid, um, the diagnostic yield of a fat pad biopsy is almost worthless, you know, 10, 20% or something like that. It, it's not that helpful. But if you happen to have a fat pad biopsy in classic imaging and the fat pad biopsy shows that there's amyloid there, that's enough to make a diagnosis. But uh, there are definitely some cases that you still need to proceed with endomyocardial biopsy. Uh, endomyocardial biopsy is obviously the gold standard for amyloid diagnosis. It targets the RV septum and amyloid the diffuse process. And so uh, it can be very uh, helpful in, in the diagnosis of amyloid. The sensitivity is essentially greater than 95%. So if somebody has a fat, if somebody has an RV biopsy that shows no amyloid, I think, I think you are done uh, with, with the, the diagnosis. It is the definitive test. Uh, but nowadays there's actually a, a quote unquote newer diagnostic modality that can be used um, in appropriate uh, algorithms to make a non-biopsy um, based diagnosis of amyloid. And so uh, technetium bone scintigraphy uh, is actually not a new modality. It's been around for years. Historically, this was used for detection of malignancy. And if you were looking for uh, metastatic uh, spread of prostate cancer or breast cancer or something like that, you could do bone scintigraphy. Nowadays, uh, those things have been replaced. Uh, bone scintigraphy has been replaced by PET scan. But for reasons that people don't really know, uh, amyloid uh, deposits bind uh, radioactive technetium. And in the US, we use technetium pyrophosphate. And uh, there's definitely greater uptake in the uh, transthyretin protein than the light chain protein. And so this is what a technetium bone scan looks like. This top panel, um, you can see the sternum, you can see the ribs because they're bones, and you can see how they kind of light up on the planar imaging. Um, on the um, quantitative analysis, you can draw a region of interest around where the heart is, and you can draw a region of interest on the contralateral side where there should just be lung. And if you can measure this heart to contralateral ratio. So this is a negative scan. The bottom image here, you can see the heart looks bright. It looks like bone. Um, and you can actually see the sternum here. You can see the ribs. You can measure the heart um, pixel density and then the lung uh, density here and the heart to contralateral ratio. If it's greater than one and a half, that is considered suggestive of ATTR cardiomyopathy by quantitative analysis. You can also do semi-quantitative grading where this is uh, what's called grade zero, where you can see the bones, you can see the sternum, you can see the ribs, but there's really no cardiac uptake, so that's grade zero. 
this is grade one where you see the, the sternum and the ribs, but the cardiac uptake is less than the, the ribs, so that's grade one. So grade zero and grade one are considered not suggestive of ATTR cardiomyopathy. Uh, grade two and grade three, grade two is where you see uh, lighting up of where the heart is, and it's uh, the same as the ribs. And grade three is where you see greater uptake in the heart than the ribs. Grade two and three are considered um, positive or suggestive of ATTR cardiomyopathy based off of uh, pyrophosphate imaging. An important point is that you do need to do SPECT imaging to confirm that there's no blood pooling. And so in these uh, SPECT images, you can see that the uptake is actually within the walls of the left ventricle here. Um, this is what it looks like at University Hospital. These are images that Jamal, who uh, helped get this uh, I think we've been doing it for about five years now or so, but Jamal's helped kind of make sure our protocols are in line with um, kind of the, the standard approved protocols. But this is what it looks like here. This is a positive scan. You can see the heart um, taking you know, up the PYP tracer, uh, or sorry, the technician tracer. And then you can see on the blood, um, the, on the SPECT imaging that the uptake is actually within the walls of the myocardium. This is a negative scan where you don't see uptake and you don't really see any uptake in the heart on the SPECT images. This is an example of a false positive scan where it looks like if you just looked at the planar images, uh, it looks like the heart's taking up, um, it has the technetium update, although when you look at this, the SPECT images, you can see that it's kind of within the blood pool itself. And that's important to note that there are some false positive uh, causes of diagnosis can, can cause a positive scan. And that's why the assessment of monoclonal proteins is, is critical. Um, previous MIs can cause focal uptake, um, things that cause diffuse myocardial scarring, renal disease, extensive mitral valve calcification can cause um, some uptake. If, if you happen to have prior rib fractures right over the heart, that could cause a false positive scan. And then there are some other rare uh, infiltrative cardiomyopathies, things like plaquenil toxicity can cause uh, a false positive scan. So this is probably the most important slide. This is sort of how um, you can diagnose somebody with amyloid based off of the um, uh, imaging modalities that we have at the University of Colorado Institution. So if you have a patient that has a clinical suspicion, suspicion of amyloidosis, they have unexplained LVH with HEFPEF, they have um, red flag symptoms like neuropathy, carpal tunnel syndrome, um, bicep tendon rupture, they have a family history of amyloid, they have these kind of low level troponins and ECG findings that are sort of pointing you in that direction. Um, the first step is to kind of to ask whether you need an MRI or not. And I actually think in most cases, you don't need an MRI. The reason to do a cardiac MRI is that you're worried about something like constrictive pericarditis, you're worried about maybe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you're worried about sarcoid or something else infiltrative. That would be the reason to do an MRI. But if you're not particularly worried about any, any of these things, you can basically just proceed down the diagnostic algorithm. So the first step is order SPEP with immunofixation, UPEP with immunofixation, and serum-free light chain. That is critical. You have to order these tests first. I see too many times people kind of go from symptoms right away to a PYP scan, and, and that's a critical mistake. You have to have those three assessments. And you're really looking for monoclonal protein abnormalities that would point you in the direction of AL amyloidosis. So if you have a monoclonal protein directed on the SPEP or UPEP, or you have an abnormal serum-free light chain ratio, and the, the values of a normal uh, kappa lambda ratio are either less than 0.26 or uh, 1.65. And there's a little bit of caveats in that patients that have renal dysfunction uh, have a little bit um, less kappa clearance and so sometimes can have kappa to lambda ratios that get up to the, the 2.5 range or so. Uh, but the, the key thing is if you have an abnormality in these kappa to lambda ratios, you really need to phone a friend, either talk to a hematologist um, and potentially um, to sort it out, you're gonna need to do a biopsy. And it kind of depends on how abnormal the kappa lambda ratio is how clearly abnormal the monoclonal protein is. There are some of these patients that you may, after discussion with hematology, go straight to a bone marrow biopsy because they may in fact have a multiple myeloma. Um, some of these patients, you may start with a fat pad biopsy if they live local. And if the fat pad biopsy is definitive, you can kind of proceed with making a diagnosis. There are some of these patients where 
Um, you know, they live far away and you want to just get the definitive test right away. So you do an endomyocardial biopsy or they had a negative fat pad biopsy. So you proceed with an endocardial biopsy. But uh, the point is that at some point along the way, if you have a suspicion of AL amyloidosis, you have to do a biopsy. If the biopsy shows that you don't have amyloid, then you're kind of done. But if the biopsy shows that you have amyloid, the next step, I'm not sure what happened there. Zoom gods are acting up here. All right, so the next step is that you have to, um, if you have biopsy proven amyloid, you have to do mass spectroscopy to determine what kind of amyloid it is. <clears throat> so the mass spect um, typing is the gold standard for diagnosing the type of amyloid. So if you do in fact have AL amyloid, the treatment is really gonna be uh, chemotherapy and uh, a lot of it's gonna be co-management with the bone marrow transplant hematology colleagues. Sometimes you do mass spectroscopy and you're surprised and right. I'm not sure what's going on with the zoom here. Sometimes you're surprised with uh, mass spectroscopy and the patient ends up having TTR amyloid, in which case the, the diagnosis is um, kind of unexpected and the treatment's completely different. And that's the critical point for why you need to do biopsy and mass spec typing is that you don't want to give somebody chemo for TTR amyloid. And particularly when you get into older patients that are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, there's a pretty high incidence of MGUS or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance among uh, patients as they get older. And so there's a reasonable number of patients that have an MGUS. And so these tests look abnormal and then separately have TTR amyloid. So th that's why the biopsy is critical. So the majority of patients I think that you will see are actually gonna have all these tests be normal. So they're gonna have a normal free light chain ratio, no monoclonal protein abnormalities. And then at, at University of Colorado, you can have them get a PYP scan. If their PYP scan is negative, you're done, amyloid's unlikely. If your PYP scan shows grade two out of three uptake or a heart to grade two or a grade three uptake or the heart to contralateral ratio is greater than one and a half, then you've diagnosed them without a biopsy with transthyretin amyloid cardiomyopathy. Then the next step is doing genetic testing. If the genetic testing is negative for a TTR mutation, they have wild type TTR cardiomyopathy, in which case the treatments are tefamidus, uh, potentially transplant, uh, potentially clinical trials, potentially diflunazole, which is off-label. We'll kind of go over that a little bit later. Uh, if they have a genetic mutation, then they're diagnosed with hereditary amyloid, then the treatments kind of depend on what is their predominant manifestation. If they have significant polyneuropathy, they may be candidates for patizaran or inotericin. If they have significant cardiomyopathy, then their treatment is tefamidus. Uh, transplant potentially has a role if they're end-stage disease. I think genetic counseling is critical if they have hereditary uh, amyloid because there are um, familial implications as it's an autosominal dominant mutation and then uh, potentially clinical trials as well. So how do you manage the cardiac complications? So I think there's kind of um, different buckets of how do you treat amyloid. And the first bucket is sort of what do you do with just the cardiac complications? And a lot of this ends up being kind of standard heart failure management. So if somebody has HEFPEF initially and then HEFREF, uh, that's a complication that we manage. We see a lot of arrhythmia issues with conduction blocks and and tachyarrhythmia, syncope tends to be a, a pretty poor prognostic marker. Sometimes we see ischemia from small vessel disease. Um, people can actually have myocardial infarctions, even though their angiograms will show normal epicardial art vessels. Uh, the incidence of thromboembolism and stroke is particularly high. Uh, neuropathy is a, is a potential complication that makes our management trick, um, more challenging with um, autonomic dysfunction and ability to tolerate um, kind of our standard heart failure medical treatments. Uh, pericardial disease is possible. And then cardiorenal syndrome is particularly common, uh, particularly if you have AL amyloid and you have concomitant light chain nephropathy. So I think managing volume status gets very tricky. This is where we rely a lot on our advanced practice providers, Mona and Maria, see a lot of these patients very regularly in clinic. There's these uh, very tight rope between being too wet and too dry. Um, when you have these uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy patients. I think there is an emerging area here probably for the use of implantable PA pressure monitoring uh, systems to potentially help mitigate this 
this balance and as uh, the CardioMEMS devices um, recently had a national coverage decision, I think we'll probably start to use this a little bit more commonly now that it's um, covered. In terms of our medical management of cardiac amyloid complications, you know, the standard heart failure medical treatments, the things that are worth noting, digoxin theoretically um, can bind to um, the amyloid proteins. And so there's a theoretical risk of, of digoxin toxicity. It's perhaps exacerbated by the fact that a lot of these patients have renal dysfunction. So if you're gonna use digoxin, you have to be pretty careful with dosing and making sure that um, it's appropriate dose for renal function and age and things like that and potentially following levels. Um, ACE inhibitors, ARNIs, angiotensin receptor blockers, I think are reasonable if somebody's hypertensive, but oftentimes are poorly tolerated in advanced disease because patients with advanced disease oftentimes have concomitant neuropathy and autonomic dysfunction and tend to have hypotension. And so um, I'm not always as aggressive as titrating up on, um, on these agents if somebody is, is struggling with low blood pressure. And similarly, beta blockers have a somewhat of an unproven reverse remodeling benefit. And so again, the, um, it's kind of use if, if needed for hypertension, use if needed for rate control, things like that. But I don't always aggressively up titrate, particularly if people are poorly tolerating them. Uh, aldosterone antagonists, I think, can be quite helpful as an adjunct to loop diuretics, particularly in helping maintain potassium balance and things like that. Uh, anticoagulation, I think, is critical. If somebody has AFib and they have amyloid, they should be uh, anticoagulated because the risk of um, embolism is quite high, uh, regardless of um, you know, what their chads vas score ends up being. Uh, pacemakers, I think, have a role in conduction uh, disturbances. Defibrillators are somewhat controversial. Historically, the mode of death in amyloid when people had sudden death was actually electromechanical dissociation that is not fixed with a defibrillator. Um, although as therapies have improved, um, there are some patients that do have ventricular arrhythmias where they perhaps seem to benefit from, benefit from an ICD. And so this is really a case-by-case uh, discussion and, and making sure the patient meets other indications for an ICD and has a life expectancy greater than a year. Transplant and LVAD, again, is a controversial area. And we'll kind of uh, talk a little bit about the role about that a little later. And I think if done in, in select patients, they can do well. If they have TTR amyloidosis among AL patients, it's probably not an ideal treatment anymore. So how do you treat the underlying disease? And so the treatment of AL amyloid um, is really phone a friend. It's a plasma cell dyscrasia. It's on the spectrum of myelo multiple myeloma, uh, light chain deposition disease, and amyloid. And so your treatment is really going to be close uh, collaboration with colleagues in hematology, bone marrow transplant at University of Colorado. Peter Forsberg and Tomer um, Mark see a lot of uh, the myeloma and amyloid patients. Um, and AL amyloid is really, it's called systemic amyloid because it can affect multiple organs. Uh, we're cardiologists, and so we think the heart's most important, and it, it does turn to affect the heart um, and most commonly. 74% of, of, of patients tend to have heart involvement, and oftentimes the prognosis is really determined on how severe the heart failure is. Um, <clears throat> systemic amyloid can also affect the kidneys, if you've heard of uh, light chain deposition disease or myelo or um, Amyloid kidney, that affects about two thirds of uh, cases of, of uh, systemic amyloid patients. They tend to have nephrotic syndrome and, and potentially renal failure. Systemic amyloid can also affect the liver and, and intestinal tract causing uh, diarrhea, malabsorption, things like that. Uh, soft tissue involvement is also possible. The classic macroglossia, the big tongue is seen in about 17%. That is again for AL amyloid. So when, you look, when you're looking for that in your patients, you're looking for evidence of AL amyloid. It doesn't really tell you much about TTR amyloid. Uh, and then AL amyloid can affect the nerves as well, the autonomic and peripheral nerves as well, causing autonomic dysfunction. So the historical treatments for AL amyloid were high dose uh, melphalan followed by a stem cell transplant. And if somebody has significant heart failure, they obviously don't tolerate the high dose melphalan very well. Um, and um, significant heart failure is a contraindication to bone marrow transplant. So uh, years ago, people thought about, well, what if you do a heart transplant followed by a stem cell transplant? So the Mass General reported their experience doing this. And I think, uh, again, look at very small numbers, 31 patients that they listed for heart transplant. They don't even describe how many people you know, that were referred to their center that didn't make the list. Uh, among those patients listed, a significant number actually passed away before they got uh, transplanted. 
Then the patients that got transplanted, they followed them up with a stem cell transplant, and then they reported their survival outcomes. And they kind of were half full uh, folks and said, you know, we had 50% survival among the patients that got heart transplant followed by stem cell transplant compared to dismal sur survival among the patients that did not get um, transplant options. Um, if you step back though and look at <clears throat> how the uh, amyloid uh, patients that got a heart transplant followed by a stem cell transplant did compare to the kind of usual uh, indications for transplant, ischemic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, things like that. The survival at um, five years among amyloid patients um, getting a stem cell transplant afterwards was really 50 to 60%, which is quite a bit lower than, than what we, you know, what we do in our current practice. And so I think uh, stem cell transplant followed by heart transplant for AL amyloid is really not a great societal treatment option. Um, and, and, and also the treatments for AL amyloid have improved. And so the current treatment of AL amyloid, the paradigm has shifted to really uh, treatments that get rid of plasma cells that subsequently get rid of the free light chain production. And then uh, supporting organs um, to allow for eventual organ recovery. And so there's a whole host of agents that are approved to treat uh, plasma cell dyscrasias. Um, and if you look at survival over the eras, uh, the treatment for AL amyloidosis has just kind of steadily improved. And I think the keys are eliminate the plasma cells. And if you do that, uh, there's actually nice basic um, science data to suggest that the light chains themselves are directly myotoxic. And so if you can get rid of the, mite, the light chains, you can actually have improvements in functional status. You can have uh, improvement in, in natriuretic peptide, even though structurally the heart still looks like there's LV thickening. Um, and so these are um, um, kind of interesting uh, in vitro data where these investigators took adult rat cardiomyocytes and they exposed them to either uh, vehicle, uh, control free light chain proteins just from uh, healthy individuals, um, free light chain proteins from patients that had AL amyloidosis, and then they measured myocyte contractility. And what they found is that exposure to free light chain proteins from uh, human uh, amyloid patients uh, resulted in decreased cell shortening, um, increased time to uh, increased um, time for re-lengthening of the cell and then abnormal calcium handling as well. And so these investigators tried to uh, mitigate those effects by uh, treating the samples with um, a redox uh, agent. It turns out that the hematologists have actually come up with chemotherapeutic agents just to get rid of the light chains and, and patients tend to show a similar improvement as their light chains improve, their functional status tends to improve. Um, and if you actually look at the most recent data on how patients with AL amyloid do, um, these are data from the Stanford cohort from 2009 to 2016, where if you look at the mean survival among stage one and stage two patients, it's actually quite, you know, 118 months for stage one, um, stage two, 76 months. And actually these authors didn't even report the median survival uh, because um, the patients when they published this were still hadn't hit the median mark. And even among patients with advanced disease, um, the stage three and the stage four patients that have pretty advanced disease had reasonable survival. The way uh, AL amyloid is staged is based off of the plasma free light chain difference, NT pro BNP and um, troponin level. So you can imagine if people have stage three and stage four, they have pretty significant heart failure. Um, so I think these are data that Chris Barrett worked on um, when he was at, at Stanford and uh, perhaps, you know, these are biased because Chris is a great doc and maybe Fertitti was, um, you know, had some leftover effect and, and all the other people that have transferred from Kelsey's and, and people that have transferred from Stanford to here maybe bias these results to show so, um, such great survival among these patients. But I think it's certainly promising. And in, in 2020, I think AO amyloid is very treatable, certainly better if you can diagnose it earlier, but uh, even the patients with advanced disease have options. What about TTR amyloid? So historically, the treatment was really solid organ uh, transplants. Uh, and that was really up until 2018. And so the historical treatment, liver, uh, liver transplant was an option uh, for hereditary ATTR cardiomyopathy, if, for, for hereditary ATTR amyloidosis. If somebody had significant cardiomyopathy, the, cardiomyopathy though, 
the liver transplant was contraindication. So there was actually people doing prophylactic uh, you know, liver transplant or primary prevention liver transplantation to prevent polyneuropathy uh, among patients that had uh, carriers of the TTR mutation. And, and in Portugal in particular, there's a very aggressive mutation where um, carriers get significant polyneuropathy in their, in their you know, 30s and 40s. And so in their 20s, they're getting a preventative liver transplant and that liver is subsequently used uh, for you know somebody who's older that maybe has a liver cancer or something else like that because it's a completely normal liver it's just overproducing a protein but that was really the treatment before 2018 was a liver transplant for someone that had significant cardiomyopathy you could sometimes do a simultaneous heart or liver transplant but that's really only done in a handful of centers in the U.S. Um, and then isolated heart transplant was an option for some patients um, and we and we've done isolated heart transplants in um, a handful of um, patients kind of depending on their mutations, uh, there is a risk of recurrence of the, the neuropathy afterwards, but it can be done selectively. If you look at outcomes among uh, TTR patients getting heart transplants, they have improved over time. And in the most recent area, they're probably equivalent outcomes to uh, other routine uh, cases of uh, causes of cardiomyopathy requiring transplant. Uh, but thankfully things have improved since 2018. And so uh, now we have, um, here if I can, um, different uh, therapy, pharmacologic treatment options. There are um, silencing agents. Batizaran is an RNA interference compound, and uh, inotericin is an oglionucleotide that blocks the um, liver's production of TTR. And so these agents are pharmacologic agents that essentially do what a liver transplant does, and both were studied in amyloid polyneuropathy and had subsequent improvements in cardiac surrogates. Uh, there have been stabilizers that have been developed. The TTR um, tetramer tends to misfold and then the misfolded uh, tetramer um, subsequently develops into amyloid fibrils. And so tofamidus was a drug that was approved in Japan and Europe for years for the treatment of, of neuropathy and was studied in the ATTRACT study that led to the approval for cardiomyopathy. And diflunazole is another TTR stabilizer that's um, uh, been used in, in neuropathy patients as well. And so uh, the reason these are important is that patizaran and inotericin were studied in polyneuropathy patients, but a lot of patients with polyneuropathy also have cardiomyopathy. And, and we in cardiology tend to get patients in to clinic sooner than the neurologist. And so uh, you may well see these patients. Um, so Petizaran was studied in the Apollo study, which we did participate in. This included neuropathy patients that had class one or two heart failure. It's an IV infusion every three weeks. It did lead to dramatic improvements in neurologic endpoints. Patients that were kind of wheelchair bound from significant neuropathy had dramatic improvements. Um, in their neurologic endpoints, and then also some improvements in biomarkers and echo parameters. This was approved in August of 2018. And I think if you have a patient that has hereditary ATTR uh, cardiomyopathy that has neuropathy symptoms, it's worth referring them to a neurologist. Diana Kwan sees a lot of these patients at university uh, to determine whether they would benefit from patizaran. Um, I know Terracin is a similar uh, mechanism uh, it's a subcutaneous injection once a week, similar to trial design that showed some benefits in um, strain and echo parameters. Uh, there were some safety concerns with thrombocytopenia and renal dysfunction, but the drug was approved in October of 2018. And again, same thing. If a patient has polyneuropathy, it's worth uh, seeing if they would benefit from this drug. Both of these agents have ongoing trials. We are participating in the Cardiotransform, which is a uh, cousin compound of inotericin that is being um, studied in patients with wild type and hereditary ATTR cardiomyopathy. And then finally, tofamidus, it's, it's a stabilizer um, that um, prevents the breakdown of the TTR tetramer. This was studied in a track study, uh, a study of uh, 20 milligrams versus 80 milligrams uh, versus placebo in patients that we see in cardiology practices, both wild type and uh, hereditary TTR patients that had heart failure. Um, this study was positive on all fronts. It showed a mortality benefit uh, at 30 months, 70% survival in tofamidus versus 57% in placebo. It showed a hospitalization benefit. It showed a benefit in 
functional status is assessed by six minute walk, as well as functional, as well as quality of life is assessed by the KCQ questionnaire. Uh, it is worth noting that it's a stabilizer. So patients actually didn't improve, they just didn't get worse over time. Um, so that's sort of the, the reason for um, starting somebody early. In terms of the 20 milligram dose versus the 80 milligram dose, uh, the mortality uh, hazard ratio tended to cross over unity for 20, which is why the 80 milligram dose got approved, although there's some controversy with uh, uh, some of the data that was not uh, presented with this analysis. Um, so the current TTR stabilizing options right now are really tofamidus is what's approved. It has a mortality benefit. Uh, side effect profile was very well tolerated. The biggest issue is the cost. This is the single most expensive cardiovascular drug uh, that's really ever been out there. Iflunazole is really minimal data for cardiomyopathy. It's all small single center studies, but it's a generic NSAID and it's very cheap. And so that's sort of why some people use Iflunazole. Um, there's clinical trials of new stabilizing agents as well. We just finished up uh, a trial with uh, AG10 and amyloid cardiomyopathy. Uh, the cost effectiveness of these is, is um, very up in the air. Patizaran, inotericin, um, quite expensive, and uh, this is a substantial issue. Um, the projected out-of-pocket cost, out cost for tofamidus for Medicare beneficiaries, which a lot of the wild-type patients are, can be up to 19,000 a year. So this is a significant barrier for, uh, for our patients. So there's a lot of areas of active investigation, I think. Um, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on an area that, um, that we, we've been investigating and, and that's sort of looking at the underlying mechanisms of ATTR. Uh, so it's kind of thought that ATTR is just an infiltrative process. The, the proteins deposit and the, and the heart doesn't work when you have this myocyte distortion and things. But, Casey Wolf is um, uh, an investigator in the, in the basic and translational labs, and she is able to do uh, isolated contractility experiments where you can actually take explanted tissue samples and then skin the uh, tissue samples so that you're removing the cell membranes and the calcium handling apparatus, the interstitium, and look at skinned myocytes as well as skinned myofibril bundles to really answer questions about sarcomeric um, dynamics and contractility parameters. This is sort of what the apparatus looks like in the lab. And if you actually look at, uh, we have data for, for four of these uh, samples that we transplanted for end-stage ATTR cardiomyopathy and, and four non-failing donors, you can uh, isolate, it, isolate these myofibrils, hook them up to a, a, a transducer and a force probe and vary the calcium concentrations from resting to an activation state to a relaxation state and measure the uh, resting tension, the maximal force, the activation kinetics, and then the relaxation kinetics as well. I think preliminarily, it does seem like the myofibrils that come from ATTR patients tend to have um, less resting tension. There's a reduction in maximal uh, active tension as well, as well as the activation kinetics um, and relaxation abnormalities as well. And this would suggest that I think ATTR cardiomyopathy does have something um, underlying within the sarcomeric um, actin myosin interactions as well. And, and perhaps that's something that needs to be uh, explored therapeutically as well. So, um, so I think in conclusion, um, amyloid, I hope that I've left you with it. It's a, it's a potentially treatable zebra in 2020. There's definitely have to have a high index of suspicion to make a diagnosis. I think the serum-free light chains are key uh, in making the right diagnosis and that with improvements in uh, imaging modalities, it's very possible to make this diagnosis without a biopsy in the majority of cases. And then as treatments have developed, I think we actually have a, a treatment for a subset of HEFPES patients that are, that are worth exploring. So that's all I have. I'm happy to, to take any questions here. Can I speak up? Yes. Hi. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Um, is there any, any other than breaking the bank, could you see any logic behind combining a, a drug like tofamidus with pteracin, you know, two drugs that have different mechanisms for the same disease? Or is that logistically impossible to think about? There, there's a lot of talk about it. The pharmaceutical companies obviously want us to do that. 
Um, in theory, the silencers reduce uh, the production of the TTR protein by about 85% or so. So in theory, there are some patients and it varies by mutation in terms of how effective the silence are, silences are. But in theory, there are some patients that may have still some low level TTR circulating around that is um, you know, a mutated version that could still contribute to disease pathology where you may want to add a stabilizer on top of the silencer. So that's sort of, I have one patient that's on both right now, but it's a very rare mutation and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, you know, there's, it's, an un, it's a controversial area and it's sort of unknown in terms of what do you do if somebody's progressing on uh, one therapy, do you switch them to another? Do you add a therapy? That's kind of an area that needs further research. I'm Ruth. On our Holcomb patients, we routinely screen for Fibers disease. What group of patients do you think we should be screening for amyloid? Yeah, I think that's where it gets a little controversial. But I think, you know, among the Hokum patients, it, it's worth doing that clinical history of red flags. You know, do they, do they have polyneuropathy symptoms? Do they have bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome? Do they have, you know, spinal stenosis? Do they have biceps tendon rupture? Do they, you know, African-American race would be a, you know, in three to four prevalence of the valine 122 mutation. So there is definitely a subset of Hokum patients that should have amyloid screening things done. Thank you. It's the first time I've been told that organ transplant is more cost effective than anything else because you can do an organ transplant for half the cost of some of these therapies and it's a one-time cost as opposed to 400 grand a year forever you know versus a liver or heart transplant's about half of that and it's a one-time cost so all right any other questions Amrath, what are your thoughts on, on transplanting these patients in terms of ethically? Do you think we should be putting a lot of these people on the transplant list? Yeah, I think the AL amyloid patients, ethically, I, I don't think there's a huge role anymore because the chemotherapeutic agents have gotten a lot better. And you look at 50, 60% survival at five years. Um, you know, we do a lot better transplanting ischemics and idiopathic cardiomyopathies right. versus 50, 60% fiber survival. So the AL, I don't think we should. Uh, the, the ATTR patients, I think selectively, if you, if you pick them selectively, they do just as well as your kind of routine ischemics and idiopathic cardiomyopathies. I think um, the wild type patients, you know, it's kind of the age that they are diagnosed. You know, if they're diagnosed at age 80, we're probably not going to transplant them. But if they're 60 when they're diagnosed, they'll do just fine. So um, I think the wild type patients, it's, it's, you know, standard transplant listing criteria. The hereditary patients, it kind of depends on their mutation. Um, you know, if they have a valine 122 mutation, oftentimes you can get by by just transplanting their heart. Some of the other mutations that are more aggressive may affect their nerves and they may have significant polyneuropathy already, in which case it's hard to just do a heart transplant that doesn't address the polyneuropathy. But if they don't have significant uh, you know, non-cardiac disease, you can do a heart transplant followed by treatment with either a silencer or a stabilizer and they should do just as well. So I think it's, it's case by case, but TTR definitely there's probably a role. And I think we've done maybe seven or so in the last three or four years now, ATTR transplants, and they've all done, you know, well, so. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone.